أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القاعلون ولا يحصي نعماءه العادون ولا يؤدي حقه المجتهدون الذي لا يضركه بعد الحمم ولا يناله غوص الفطن ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وآل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين صاحب العصر والزمان خليفة الرحمن إمام الإنس والجان ولعن الله وعداهم جمعين إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هو الذي أرسل رسوله بالحدى والدين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على The privilege of faith has been our topic since day number 1 and tonight is our last discussion on this topic we are thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the tawfiq and to uh, for us for him guiding us throughout these uh, past 14 days uh, let me express my uh, gratitude, my appreciation to the Bayt al-Qaim community, all of you and, and your respected families, uh, for your love and your respect and the welcoming me every time I come. Uh, it's an honor for me that I have spent these past two weeks with, with, with all of you. I ask you to please um, forgive me if anything I said was incorrect or it hurt you. And please, in these upcoming nights, please remember me in your du'as, inshallah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. My attempt uh, since day number one has been to strengthen our aqidah inside of our youth and strengthen the aqidah to the point where you, you don't see it only as faith, but you see it as a privilege that you believe in such a faith. And that privilege was meant as not only yaqeen for yourself, but as a shield and a protection for those outside of you who are looking to infiltrate inside of your hearts and play with your iman and your faith and force you to question the very principles that your parents spent their entire life giving you as you were getting older. And so we have talked about many, many things across 14 nights. It's a long 14 nights and some of you have been with me since day number one and may Allah bless all of you for that. But I did my best to tackle those issues that I thought were critical in the building of our ideology. For the past two nights now, we've been looking at the idea that we will only see this faith and this iman as a privilege when we begin to understand the benefits of this faith. That what are the fawaid, what are those fa'idiha, what are those benefits that come about when you tread the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and specifically the ideology that I'm trying to present to all of you. And as a closing, <clears throat> Discussion tonight, I want to tackle a number of issues in my a lot of time, inshallah, to ensure that we understand what is it that I was trying to achieve. Before that, recite one salat, Allah Muhammad, Allah Muhammad, please. And while there are many documents, PhDs, books written on the benefits of faith, one topic that I've left for the last lecture of mine is that. With faith comes validation. With faith comes this idea that now you have some worth inside of you. And I wanted to initially talk a little bit about validation. It is a, uh, it's a growing topic. It's one that's affecting a lot of our youth today. What's meant by validation is that the person who needs to be validated is a person who needs to constantly be affirmed and be told that their feelings and their emotions are worthwhile. 
A person does not feel validated when they feel like they're being silenced or quieted or ignored, either inside the home, inside the center, or amongst their friends, or even within themselves. And if I can kind of summarize one of the major fundamental issues facing our youth today that sometimes our parents don't understand, it's this issue of validation. We live in a generation of these youth that constantly need to be validated. Not everybody, some of you are very strong in your self-identity and self-esteem, many of you are not. And in the era of social media where everything is public, everything is glamorized, this is a need that is constantly ongoing. Where there is this need for some reason to post and to announce every little thing that happens throughout your day. And then for there to be an affirmation, a confirmation, a like, an approval, a thumbs up, a thumbs down, a comment, an emoji, something to say, yes, you know, the fact that you went to the gym today was approved by most of your friends on Facebook. And that is validation. Now, when you do get validated, when you feel like, okay, I, what I believe in, what I say is worthwhile, it's the best feeling in the world. The problem is when you don't get validated. When all of a sudden now you start to feel like I don't have any worth inside of me, right? So you take a picture of yourself where you think you look great and you post it on social media and that picture gets zero comments. Now what you've done is you've thrown yourself out there, right? And maybe out of the 20 you took, this was the best one that you felt was, what was gonna be the one that will really attract all the comments and it doesn't happen. Now, you believe the others didn't comment because they see you as someone who's ugly or someone who you know, is weird or someone who dresses off. And that, you know, that happens enough times, it has, has an effect on your self-worth. Where faith comes about is that faith gives you that validation that you've been looking for from other people. The faith gives you that validation. And more specifically, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's already validated you, that you don't need the validation of everybody else. And let me explain that a little bit. Salu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. You know, it's, it's not my topic and, uh, you know, just very briefly, you know, th this age that we live in where mental health now is a, is a big issue that a lot of our parents don't know how to handle and I don't blame them. It's not something that all of you went through when you were growing up in your respective countries or maybe even here. You know, the, the, the thought of, uh, of a 15 year old, a 17 year old having anxiety or stress or insomnia or taking pills to calm themselves down or losing their appetite because you know, either of their, you know, their, their circle of influence or their school or their work or there's too much happening. A lot of our parents today don't understand that concept. And some parents, not everybody, some parents just kind of undermine, say, you know what, what's the big deal? Like, he has no idea what stress is, right? So when his 16-year-old son comes home and says, Dad, you know, I feel anxious, I don't feel right, I'm not sleeping, I'm not eating, something is wrong, you know, instead of tackling it or handling it, you think, you know what, you have no idea about what stress is. Get married, grab a house, raise some kids, then I'll show you stress. Right now, all you have to do is study, that's it. I'm paying for everything, I'm giving you food, I'm giving you the heat and the AC, you don't need to stress about anything. And the child walks away and the, and the issue is not being dealt with. And you're right, to a certain degree, the stress and anxiety is minimal compared to what you've gone through. But for them, they live in an era of constant validation, which we, even me, we never went through. I never had social media, alhamdulillah, growing up, thank God. All of these kids do. And it's important that, you know, as parents, we take this for a reality. And no, I'm sorry, the, the solution is not always better namaz or paro. It's not always a solution. Yes, no doubt, there is dua, but there's also dawa as well. Both hand in hand, it has to be tackled properly. Because we live in an era, like I said, where these kids need to be constantly validated. And that's a different discussion on why. And it's a very public, can you imagine every ounce of your day is public for the, for, for, for the community to either approve or disapprove. It's taxing, it's emotional, 
It's draining after a while. It plays with, 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 your, with, with, with your psyche. You're bound to have an impact on whether or not I feel ugly or I spend all my time in front of a camera or I spend all my time in my room because I feel like nobody listens to me, I have no worth, blah, blah, blah. All that is bound to lead to anxiety and stress. I've told this, I've told this many, I have 16 year olds that I know that take antidepressant pills, diagnosed by doctors, right? So it's an issue that is extremely, extremely important. I know that some communities are trying to you know, um, educate the masses, having seminars, having talks, et cetera, et cetera. E embrace this new reality, okay? It's not just the idea of you know, this new generation playing victim mode or being overdramatic or oversensitive. No, it's not only that. There is a reality to this, to, to this as well. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And, and, this, and this validation begins at home. It begins at home. The first validators of any child are his parents and her parents. I cannot stress that enough. There comes a moment where you are, as a father, as a mother, you are the superhero of your child. You can do no wrong. The same way that these kids light up when it comes to Marvel and DC and the latest Avengers movie, and they'll watch it five times and spend 50 bucks watching it, there came a time where you were, you, you were their superhero. You were their Iron Man and their Superman. They would talk about you in the playground, that my dad can beat up your dad. Yeah. My dad has bigger muscles than your dad does. My dad's taught, oh, is that your dad? Yeah, he's a giant. And along the way, there came a moment where that kind of declined. I humbly ask all of you, especially at a time where I know it's, you know, you have to figure out a different style of parenting because you parent the way you were, you, you were raised. And let's face it, you know, our parents back home, that generation, immigrant parents, they don't know all this stuff about affection and validation because they never got it growing up. <laughs> I mean, their father never came and had a talk with them, a hug, a handshake, didn't happen. The father was, you know, the mafia king inside the house. When he enters the house, you sit up straight. When you hear him walking down the stairs, you're like, oh my God, oh my God, dad's coming. But that era is, has to fade away. You have to begin to validate your kids. I mean, growing up, you know, I tell you often stories about my father. I don't do it on purpose. He just comes up in my mind all, all, all the time. Because he left at a time in my life when he was very close to me. As, as I've, I've, told you, I've told you guys many times. He was my best friend two years before he passed away. And if, I, if I, think of, I think back to my memories, I specifically remember, if you don't mind me giving you my details, I remember growing up in Toronto, we had a, we had a small three-bedroom apartment, and every Saturday morning, the, 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 the best thing that we could do was we would climb into mom and dad's bed on Saturday morning. And we look, we look forward to it, at least, at least I did, I'm not sure what about my other siblings, I did. So Saturday morning, 8 a.m., we're bright, we're early, but we have no idea if mom and dad are still sleeping. So I would, I remember vividly, I would open the door just a little bit, just a little bit, and then I would hear the famous, those words that would light up my eyes. Ajo, ajo, ajo. Ajo. Meaning he's awake. Awake on a Saturday morning, no work, no school, that's it. We climb into bed, and now he's saying, look, it's open. So we, boom, we barge in, we come running into the bed, and there, you know, and he would play wrestle with us. My dad was a six-foot-four guy, same, same size as me. He would play wrestle, headlock, you know, body slam, this and that, and for five, six, seven minutes before my mom would go and start breakfast. And those were moments that would do what? That would validate me. Because for those five minutes, nothing mattered for my father but me. And even now in my 40s, can I tell you, in my 40s, when I have moments where I have, you know, I have moments of depletion, I have moments where I'm like, okay, you know, what's happening? My own, my own worth drops, my own kind of self-esteem drops. Everyone goes through it. The thing that gets me through those moments is the ajao, ajao, ajao. Come, come, come inside. And I stop and I think, you know what? There was a moment where, my, where I was everything for my father. It carries throughout your life. You know, I can, I can count on one hand the, the, the moments of affection with my father, the moments where he laughed at my jokes, the moments where he praised me and complimented me, on one hand, to my face. And that sometimes carries me through the storm that I go through. My point is that 
It's vital that as parents, it doesn't matter what age your child is, I'm sorry, your, par- your child could be a parent himself. But once in a while to validate your child, to let them know that they have worth from you as a father and mother. Because somewhere deep down inside, there's an eight-year-old kid running around at the playground saying, my dad can beat up your dad. He, he, they could be 48 right now, but still, to a certain extent, you are still their superhero. It begins at home, especially if you have small kids, then it's a no-brainer to constantly be with them, affectionate, tell them you know, everything that they've done wrong and they've done good as well. Be fair in your, in your judgment, but validate them. If they have a story to tell, listen. If they have an idea, implement it. Let them know that they have worth inside the home. I mentioned this last year in my Generation Gap series about the idea of being silent and quiet at home and shushing your kids. Tell them, let's go, let's go. Let's go. No, at that moment now, you feel like you're nothing inside the home. When you're not validated inside the home, you search for validation outside the home. And that's where we've lost our children. The moment they search for X, Y, Z outside the home for validation, that's a really difficult situation to happen. But they first search inside the home for validation. So maybe sometimes, you know, in between the discipline, you can stop and recognize your child. Maybe wrap your arms around them. Maybe tell your daughter how beautiful she is to you. Maybe tell your son, let's say, how amazing he is, right? I know, you might think, you know, they know that, they they may know that, but they want to hear it constantly. They want to hear it constantly because they are searching for validation. They need that validation. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now the question is why? Why don't we see God as the ultimate validator? Up and down the Quran, وَلَقَدْ كَرَمْنَا بَنِي Adam. I have honored the human being. I've given you everything. I've made you, I made you أَشْرَفَ الْمَخْلُوقَاتِ The best of my creation. I made everybody else do sajda to you. But still, for some reason, you don't feel like I validate your existence. Still, you search for worth outside. And the reality is that the deen and Islam is your worth. That's what makes you feel worthy. Find that worth inside of your ibadat. Find that worth inside of your deen. Know that you belong to that creator who's obsessed with forgiving every mistake that you make. That's the problem. The problem is that because we don't forgive ourselves, we think God hasn't forgiven us either. Think about this for a moment, just for a moment. You get a phone call one day from one of your friends and he's a wreck, he's a mess, he's hit rock bottom, whatever rock bottom is for him. He's bumbling, he's stumbling, he's, he's stuttering, he has no idea what he's emotional, this and that, until you calm him down and he tells you exactly what happened. And then he says, This is rock bottom. I've never been lower in my life. And the first person I thought of calling was you. Okay? Now you think for a moment, wow, this guy's hit rock bottom. His first name in his head was mine. Okay? That tells you that you're something special to him. Correct? When we have our moments of rock bottom, and we're bound to have moments of rock bottom, and we end up committing a sin, and we have this horrible regret inside of us, shaitan then interjects and tells us that if I were you, I would stay far away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the last person who wants to hear from you. After what you did last night, how dare you even think about any form of worship the next morning? And we convince ourselves, you're right. You're right. Meanwhile, God wants that feeling that when my banda, when my Christian hit rock bottom, when he committed terrible sins, and he, hit, and, he, and, he, and he committed that one sin that he promised me he would never commit, but he committed for whatever reason, and he has hit rock bottom in tears, groveling, and instead of going here, 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 he turns back to me and says, God, I've hit rock bottom now. I have nowhere else to go but up. This is the worst I've been in terms of my relationship with you. But I'm coming back to you. The same feeling you would have if a friend of yours called you at rock bottom is the exact same feeling God would have when his beloved creation comes back to him at rock bottom. You know, we recite 
Namaz al after Maghrib. Beautiful lessons in those verses of Nabi Yunus. He's inside the belly of the whale. فَنَادَ فِي ظُلَمَاتِ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنْتَ سُبْحَانَكَ إِنِّي كُنْتُ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ Amongst the darkness, the darkness, Nabi Yunus called out that there is no God but you. I am the one that messed up. إِنِّي كُنْتُ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ Meaning what? I recognize now that you are the one who should be glorified. I've hit rock bottom. I'm in the belly of a whale. This is really rock bottom for me. But now I'm turning back to you. To say, you were never the problem, God. It was me. And the Quran says that we heard him. We answered him. We freed him. وَكَذَلِكَ نُنْجِي الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And we'll do the exact same thing for the mu'mineen. The worst thing you could do is convince yourself that God has not forgiven me. Because the, the reality is, the way that we hold grudges, Allah doesn't hold grudges. Allah does not hold grudges. Like I, I mentioned a few nights ago, you remember the paper example with my son Hassan? That he forgives the hadith says to the point where the sin never occurred to begin with. And the problem is that because we've convinced ourselves that God doesn't want to hear from us, we don't say anything to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at this hadith by Imam Ali alayhi salatu wa salam. Allahumma salli ala. He says that God is to you as you think he is to you. Oh, such a profound hadith. If we think he hasn't forgiven us, then we will act like with God like he hasn't forgiven us. And when you have wronged somebody and they haven't forgiven you, you avoid them like anybody else. You don't call them, you don't message them. If they're coming in the door, you go out this door. Because we haven't quite let go of our mistakes, I'm sure God hasn't let go of my mistakes either. And that's the fault. That's the fault. Time and time again, he would say, you know, That when they ask you about me, tell them, I'm near. I will answer the call of the one who calls me, Whenever they call me, I'll answer their call. Whatever they call me, rock bottom, flying high, great day, full day, full night of worship, you ask Allah, he'll, he'll answer you. Rock bottom, you ask Allah, he'll answer you. da'an. You want to make an appointment for a big shot celebrity, you have to make an appointment months in advance. Allah says, it's not about my schedule. It's about your schedule. When you're ready to call me, I'm ready for here to listen to your call. But don't think for a moment that your sin or your terrible act is greater than my mercy. Don't think for a moment because the reality is to climb the ladder of spirituality, my youth, please, to climb the ladder of spirituality, I'm sorry, you don't need a perfect past. You don't need a perfect past. You don't need a closet free of skeletons. You don't need you know, to be ma'asum. It's not like Allah only hears the ma'asum for his du'as. The first plan of action is no doubt, don't commit sin. We do our level best to not commit sin. But if it happens, it will happen. Shaitan gets the best of us, we slip, ignorance, our, our, our nafs, our whatever the case may be, then what? Then that's it? Allah says, look, that's it. I give you one shot. Khulafis, you messed up, now you can go wherever you want to go. Don't come back to my kingdom. Why is it that shirk is the only one that's not forgivable? Because at that moment, now shirk is gone from his system. You've left Allah's kingdom and you've gone to somebody else's house. He said, look, I would love to forgive you, but you left my kingdom. How do I forgive you if you're not mine? I can only handle those who are mine. You've gone and you've worshipped A, B, and C. If you come back under la ilaha illallah, whatever you commit, it's worthy of my mercy. What is the ultimate insult to Allah is to convince yourself that, oh, look, Asr-Bahai, you have no idea, man, I've made some big mistakes, Asr-Bahai. Terrible sins. Like you say that right now, and you have no idea what I've done in my past. And I don't care what you've done in your past. The biggest injustice to Allah is to convince yourself that your past is bigger than his mercy. Making him powerless to forgive you. Making his, his, his mercy limited, can you imagine? 
Now imagine this entity, this entity who's waiting by the phone, metaphorically, waiting by the phone for you to call him at rock bottom. At rock bottom, he says, at rock bottom, you call me. The moment you call me at 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to answer your call. And I'll pick you up, I'll dust you off, and I'll push you along the way. Imagine now taking that entity out of your life. Imagine not having that entity there. So now you search for anybody, rock bottom, rock bottom, rock bottom. What's there? Casinos are there, alcohol is there, drugs are there, women are there. What we see in society, a godless society, turns to that when they hit rock bottom. That's why what I want from this discussion in these 14 days, my khulasa, my conclusion, is the idea that we have to move from worshipping Allah out of obligation to worshipping Allah because I need to worship Allah. I need to worship Allah. It's my need. I need him in the morning. I need him in the, at night. I need him when I'm asleep. I need him when days are amazing. I need him when I hit rock bottom. Because I cannot for a moment picture my life without him. I cannot for a moment. It's no longer obligation. Forget the candy now. Clean your room, get a candy. Clean your room, get a candy. Pray namaz, get jannah. Pray namaz, get jannah. After all, the candy is gone. I clean my room because mama is very happy when I clean my room. I pray a lot because I need to pray a lot without before Allah. If I take that away, then I'm left with nothing. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And this is the month to do it. To find that migration from what we should be doing to what, sorry, what we are doing to what we should be doing. And oftentimes, you know, we, you know, it's a point I've made before. We talk about hijrat, the migration. We think about a physical migration. A geographical, from one place to another, right? Many of you have migrated from India, Pakistan, or wherever, from Iraq to this country, let's say, for example. That's one migration, but there's a bigger migration where you move inside your soul from what you can do to what you should be doing. And the example I gave is Shabi Hijrat, the night of migration from Mecca to Medina. We, we discussed that, that event on, in one dimension, the Prophet physically moving from Mecca to Medina. But the reality is there were two migrations that night. One was physical and one was spiritual. One was physical of the, of the Prophet literally walking out of Mecca into Medina and one was Imam Ali migrating towards Allah closer and closer and closer. Where the Quran says there are those who sell their nafs out to please their Lord. And if you ask him why would you do such a thing? He says I have no option. I have to do this for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no other option. So migration is not only physically shifting from one place to another geographically. Migration is a spiritual migration from one level to another. From the idea of mawjood to matloob. From existence to a preferred level of existence. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So begin to forgive yourself like your creator has forgiven you. Move forward. Yes, mistakes have been made. Learn from those mistakes. Do your level best to not repeat those mistakes. I'm not condoning sin. Please do not get me wrong. Asabai gives a free pass to sin. No, I'm not saying that. That's a game you play with God. You know? Believe, deceive, believe, deceive, seesaw. No, that's a game you play. That's not the game that he wants. You've deceived or we've sinned. Let's say, for example, we go begging to him. Inshallah, he's forgiven us. Now we tell ourselves, Allah, please, please give me that tawfiq to not repeat that sin. That's not, that's not the game. That's exactly what happens when you ask Allah for repentance. He says, What would I do by punishing you? What would I do by punishing you? It's such a beautiful question he asks. What do you think I would gain? What do you think I would gain by punishing you? Is that what you think I want to? No. It's not like that. Part of the reason why we don't see the faith as a validator because we don't see the creator as a validator. And that creator has given us time and time again reminders that I am your first validator. I defend you when you're not there. I look after you when you're not there. I dust you off. I pick you up. I forgive your many mistakes. And I constantly give you risk and mercy time and time again. And yet you still look for, am I worthy? Am I worthy? Am I worthy? Allah says, you're worthy. You're mine, you're worthy. That's it, khalas. You don't need to post a selfie to have, to, to, have, to have validation. You don't need an emoji to sit there and tell me, yeah, okay, I am somebody. God has already made you somebody. 
It's a matter of you looking inside of you. You know, picture this, last point. Picture this, you're sitting in front of an ocean, okay? A major body of water. And you're sitting there and you're looking out to water. And wherever you look, Hadden Nazar, they say in Urdu, wherever you look is water. Massive body of water, the ocean. And you're bound to think for a moment that, wow, look how small I am compared to this massive body of, of water. That if I was to swim, I'd swim in one small corner of this massive ocean. And I wish sometimes my youth would stop and think, this ocean is nothing compared to what's inside of you, what God's given you. These shirts these kids, these kids wear, there's a universe inside of you. alam akbar inside of you. And the ocean pales in comparison to what's inside of you. That's the worth you need to find. Not through anybody else, through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And through your faith. Your parents, your mother, your father, your grandparents, your ulama have done far too much to give you this faith. Take this faith as a gift, build it, strengthen it, and take it as a privilege. It's a privilege, it's a blessing. Know that behind it is a creator who has validated you time and time again. And move forward in this. Let the enemies come and attack you all they want. But your building is too strong inside of you to sway. I mentioned this several times. In this day and age, we don't want flags, we want mountains. Flags go as the wind, mountains stay where they are as the wind blows. It doesn't matter what's outside of them. We ask you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our qaleel ibadat inshaAllah. We ask you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us to understand that you are our ultimate validator and to get closer to you inshallah we ask you allah to accept our amal and forgive our sins in the month of ramadan and finally allah we ask you to make us isqabil and worthy of the zuhur of imam al-zamana inshallah and to be beside him during his mission